Hello, everybody. Testing, testing. Oh, good. I see audio levels. I just got to check the audio levels first. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Astro Coffee Hangout. It's Thursday, 3 o'clock. We are here every Thursday to talk about astronomy and do all kinds of stuff. First up, I just got a couple of programming notes. You guys probably were expecting a hangout with the EV Scope guys, the Unistellar guys. Well, we had to reschedule till next week because I wasn't ready. It wasn't their fault. It was their fault. I haven't had a chance to use the scope yet. And they, they don't want me to do the hangout until I've had a chance to use it. And so it's sitting right here, uh, set up and ready to go. But the weather has been crap. We just had a big, um, a big front move in last night. Lots of rain and thunderstorms. And so I couldn't use it last night. But now, although here in Central Florida, it's cold AF. Um, it's still, you know, it's clear. So I'll be able to use the scope tonight. And, um, that's another thing that's been happening is that my, my video has been going out. So hang tight folks. I'll be right back. I knew this would happen during the stream. So it just, this zoom meeting has just been randomly stopping my video there. I'm back. Oh, now it's not going to let me do it at all. <laughs> oh, there we go okay and so it's just been randomly stopping my video and now it's not letting me do it for any length of time crap okay um well what you are now looking at is one of my guests mike forceland he's the only one that's got a video camera that apparently is working right now uh <laughs> hi mike and welcome thank you for joining us but uh let me try one more time please come on and stay why are you not staying there's something there's something weird yeah it's not even using the right camera now. I think it's, um, I think it's my, oh, there it goes. Well, hopefully it'll stay. Oh, <laughs> this is the fun of live uh, television. The, yes, okay. that's right. All right. <laughs> the so, fun of live television. Exactly. exactly. All right. So instead of doing the hangout with the, with the EV scope, which will be next Thursday, same time today, we are going to be talking about this new object that you may have heard about in the news about whether or about it's called a, they're calling it a mini moon earth's new we have a, a new moon uh it's been it was just confirmed recently by the uh, international astronomical union's uh, minor planet center and it is out and about the earth, uh, very dim, very small. So to talk about this, I was able to grab my good friend, uh, Mike Forsland and Sam Dean, both of whom are with us here. And they are part of something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in the, in the hangout, which is, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, that's right. He doesn't, There's Mike Sam. doesn't have a camera either. Or I'm sorry, Sam doesn't have a camera either. Uh, he's joining us by audio only. Uh, but these guys run, some, uh, they have a YouTube channel called Asteroid Hunters, which I want you guys to definitely subscribe to. The link is in the description box of this video. Also, uh, they do a Twitch stream, uh, gosh, several times a week. I don't know if you do it regularly, Mike, do you? Yeah, well, we try to. It just oh, kind of depends you? on what's up and uh, what needs observations. Okay. Uh, so then we, we try to do we try to do a few times a week if we can. You Good. Know? Okay. Well, so. if that is, so follow them on Twitch at switch.tv slash asteroid hunters with an underscore in there. Uh, and it's a great stream. They've got a lot of really good stuff and they're going to talk about what they do uh, a little bit later on in the, in the hangout. But first Mike and Sam, who wants to go first? Now, Sam was telling me that he actually wrote a lot of the information that's in the Wikipedia page about this object. But what I want one of you to do is to introduce it to us. What is it? And, you know, tell us a little bit about what, when it was discovered and all of that kind of stuff. Who wants to go Mike or Sam? Go, go. Why don't you go ahead and talk Sam about it? Sam seems he does know a lot more about this, uh, this object than we do since it is a uh, <laughs> much, much newer object, but, uh, this is right up Sam's alley because it's kind of an unusual object that comes, uh, comes flying into our orbit. So, uh, I know this is, uh, this is right up, right up Sam's alley and, uh, and, uh, he's, he's by far the expert on this. <laughs> okay. Take it away, Sam. Tell us a little bit about this thing. And while you're talking, I'm going to show the uh the earth sky uh picture of it that's on the web page there i'll just put that up real quick are you there right right hi yeah. i'm here sorry Good. about that uh, that's all right uh anyway uh effectively uh this is a pretty unusual occurrence for us to have to do uh to have to prepare for so usually uh discoveries like this well discoveries of near-earth objects and stuff get done pretty quickly and you know 
discovered in and out and then they're uh, confirmed and stuff. But this one ended up being kind of weird. Uh, basically what happened is uh, on February 15th, uh, the Mount Lemmon survey or the Catalina Sky survey uh, in on Mount Lemmon, Arizona, uh, discovered an object about 20th magnitude uh, that seemed to be moving pretty fast. And uh, they got a few more observations of it from other observatories over the next day or so. And at that point, it started to look suspiciously like it was orbiting us. Uh, now, finding objects orbiting us isn't exactly a new thing. Yeah. Uh, we find things orbiting us all the time. But what was a bit different about this one was that it didn't look like it was an artificial satellite of ours. Uh, we couldn't link it to any kind of known objects that we knew we'd launched. And we tend to keep pretty good track of objects we launch this far out. So the question was, is this an artificial satellite that we forgot about? Or is this a genuine rock that entered us that entered our orbit? Uh, so over the next few days, uh, as it started dimming and getting further away from us, we got a few more uh, observatories to follow up on it. And uh, the main way that we're able to tell if an object is a rock or a satellite is actually due to a pretty unusual fact. Uh, basically, rocks are solid. I know that's a really simple, dumb thing to point out, but. Uh, it's important here because satellites aren't solid. So That's when right. the sun shines onto these objects, uh, it actually creates a very slight pressure on them. And just kind of like a paper bag being blown by the wind versus a rock not being blown by the wind, when an object is really big but doesn't have a whole lot of density to it, that thing tends to get tossed around a lot. Uh, my good friend Bill Gray refers to them affectionately as empty trash bag objects satellites that are just really like empty but have a ton of surface area so they just get tossed around everywhere so the main way that we can tell if an object orbiting us is natural or not is by observing it for a few days and seeing if it starts moving around weirdly like it shouldn't so far uh all of the observations that we've had though have indicated that it's not moving around weirdly that it's behaving exactly like a rock would so we think it's probably a rock uh, and... We've only been observing it for a week or so, but based on how we've projected it back into time, it seems to have been orbiting us since around late 2017 or early 2018, uh, but is on its way out right now. It's not coming back again. Uh, it reached its closest point to us on the 13th, just before it got found. And right now, the moon has just tossed it out into orbit around the sun instead, so it's not going to be coming back for a while. Not until uh, 2038, I believe. Okay, so the and and this was recently just confirmed. So it was confirmed what two days ago by the uh, minor the minor planet center at the IAU, correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So and they and they before they confirmed it, before they were able to say that this was a natural occurring rock, they got rid of a. They did what you suggest, what you were just talking about, which makes sure that it wasn't an artificial. Uh, you know, or something else that it was actually a rock in space around the earth. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. on that, in fact, uh, the funny thing is a couple days after it got discovered, the minor planet center was so not used to having objects just orbiting us that they actually removed it a couple days after because it's orbiting us. So it must not be must, a rock. Yeah, must not so be, they must removed be it for not right. being an asteroid, exactly. despite the fact that it was an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so can you show us uh, via your screen share, uh, either one of you, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mike or, or Sam, uh, the, the orbit of this thing? And let's talk about some of the characteristics of it. You want me to pop that up there, Sam? Uh, I've got the more uh, okay, go ahead. accurate URL of it. So yeah. I suppose maybe I should let me get that up for you real quick. All right. Does that show up? Hang on just a sec. Let me get rid of some of this Looks other like stuff. It. Yep, I've got it showing. It's being broadcast now, so we're looking at your screen. Right. Uh, ignore the straight lines right now. Those are just artifacts of the simulation, but uh, this is a plot, a time lapse of its orbit back over the last few years as it kind of careened through our inner, uh, like the orbit of the Earth and stuff, getting messed about by the moon. Um, I want you to pay special attention to... Uh, Oh, it's really lagging today. I want you to pay special attention whenever it gets to it, to uh, the time around March 20th to April 1st of 2019,
because at that point, the moon really tosses it in and it gets really, really close to the Earth. Uh, when we initially first observed it, we thought that the fact that it got so close to the Earth in March might be some indication that it got launched around March. But as we got more observations, it became clearer that it didn't actually. Uh, and from that point forth, it, the orbit kind of stabilized and it seemed to have either entered our orbit in uh, around December 2017 or maybe January right there. See that? See yeah. that right there? Yeah. That bit where it just like careens right towards Earth. I think it got to like 2,000 kilometers above our surface. Wow, that's really close. Let's let let's all let's also be clear too that this this object is uh, you know, roughly six to twelve feet in diameter. Just so everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> not, we're, we're not, not talking about. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, yeah, that's where I was afraid of. Just I, I'm seeing some of the chat. I'm like, oh man, is it coming? In? It's like just so everybody knows this this uh, this is a very small object. That's the reason why we didn't we didn't catch it uh, because it's. A small object and much more difficult to uh, detect. Now that's right, and we're going to talk more about what you guys observe with your equipment in just a minute. But this is too dim even for your stuff to see, right? Oh, it this is. is its last it is. orbit. You see, the moon kind of messes about with it, yeah, and then it just leaves our orbit right, right after. Just out. Okay, well, now. it's coming back again, but after this one, the moon throws it out too much for it to. So, because of the uh, the interaction that it's had with moon and and with Earth, we it's currently captured by the earth and yep. it is but it's but only temporarily it's only going to be here until about for another couple of more months correct yeah yeah so we'll be it'll looking be at the simulations that is the case I, I mean i'm looking at the minor planet center it's showing only 52 observations on this on this object uh which isn't a tremendous amount but it seems to be en en enough to kind of understand what's going on with this thing well that's a pretty wild orbit though um to be able to, I mean, that, yeah, for just 50 observations. So what kind of simulation is this? Is this just an algorithm that uh, they're using for, um, based on these 50 observations? Uh, you'd probably have to ask Tony about that one. Uh, Tony, Dunn, Tony Dunn of Orbit Simulator, but... Oh, okay. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's just a basic uh, three-body orbit simulating thing where it tries and calculates how the moon and the Earth are affecting how that thing is moving over time. Okay. So this thing is small, folks. As they were just pointing out, it's dark, uh, magnitude 30, I think, is what it is. And it's tiny. Uh, just uh, it's to... only magnitude 24 right now. Only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, yeah, only. Right. Yeah. Let me just uh, let me just look up and <laughs> exactly. see that. Yeah. So that is pretty. Regardless, it's really dim. And uh, so the kinds of equipment that they're using to see this uh do you, can you guys tell us a little bit about the catalina sky survey what do they observe with and how often and all of that kind of, it's a sky survey so presumably they do it every night right yeah those those guys are uh they're out every night um you, they actually do have a website based out of the university of arizona uh from what i understand they they remotely control their uh, scopes up on mount lemon and uh they have um a number of of scopes they've got a 1.5 a 1 meter a 0.7 meter as well um and they're basically looking at uh you know these sky surveys now they have from what i understand they have um one one telescope that does kind of the big sky surveys and then when they find stuff they actually have a little bit smaller telescopes they have one that's a one meter um that is um it's got a field of view of 0.3 degrees with a pixel scale of 1.03 degrees. Uh, this telescope recovers 40 to 80 targets, ne neos per night, with a limiting magnitude of 22, uh, which is really dim. Um, but uh, these these guys can shoot that in about uh, 30 seconds with this. Uh, uh, some of their scopes that they have, um, they can get down to 19, 20 magnitude at 30 seconds with with what they're observing. And they are they are one of the big players in this game. I mean, there's obviously there's Pan Stars and a lot of other ones, but uh, Catalina um, actually is, is 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 by far one of the biggest as far as uh, what they capture on a nightly basis and uh, uh, the things that they're imaging. Is uh, is Panstar still taking data or are they done? They are still. Taking oh yeah, data. Panstar oh, is. Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought it was just. A, uh, I thought Pan they had Stars. run their their. No, they're observing still. Uh, they're still doing a lot of that stuff. Uh, Atlas, a lot of who who we uh, we work with Atlas as well, but uh, but they're the yeah, Panstar is definitely in the game. Okay. 
mind if I mention something real quick? I do not mind. Go right. Oh, by the way, uh, your last name is uh, Dean. D e e n. Yes. People, somebody yep. was asking about that. So there you go, Sam Dean. Go for it. Uh. I want to mention that although their telescopes aren't the biggest in the game right now, uh, the Catalina Sky Survey is actually pretty much one of the biggest sky, the biggest sky survey, the, the biggest sky survey I would argue right now in terms of their sheer number of asteroid discoveries and observations. Yeah, uh, they've been in the game for like a really long time, the early two thousands at least, and they find basically three quarters of all asteroids that are near the Earth at any given moment. And Panstars usually picks up the rest, but it's mostly Mount Lemmon, uh, the Catalina Sky Survey, who's picking the big ones up. Wow, that's really cool. Um, well, let's talk about the work that you guys are doing. So, as I mentioned at the top of this uh, top of this hangout, uh, Mike and Sam and many others uh, working with him uh, look for near Earth objects, PHAs, potentially hazardous asteroids, and all kinds of stuff that's up there. So, um, Mike, tell us a little bit about asteroid hunters and the and the the and ha the, so maybe a little bit about the equipment you're using, but more importantly, what you're doing with your observations once you take them. So, um, asteroid hunters was was kind of formed uh, <laughs> as a, a father son uh, adventure. Uh, my 15 year old. I'm sorry. Son let me just I... interrupt you for a minute. Okay. Okay. You may. <laughs> You watch their stream, folks, and you will see that the where Mike is sitting right now is it would make any NASA Hubble Operations Center look, you know, Spartan by comparison. They've got <laughs> quite a mission control down there. Uh, so it's really impressive. And to say that it's a father son thing is really being very humble because it's amazing the stuff they've got and what they're doing with it. Go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry I interrupted. I just had <laughs> to say right. that. I've been, no, by the no, way, I, I I've been to the that. Hubble. <laughs> I've been to the Hubble Control Center at, at Goddard, and I'm here to tell you, your your room there is more impressive. Well, and, and, and part of that is that it started with my son and I building building computers together, uh, which goes way back. But uh, we've always had a kind of a love for astronomy. And, uh, you know, uh, about a year ago, I, I started uh, talking to him. It's like, let's let's try to do some some science. Let's see if we can do something that that really is uh, a meaningful in uh, in astronomy and, and utilizes the equipment, the, the the massive computers that we've built, the things that we've put together. So we we started on this about a year ago. It took us a year <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to just to figure it out because, uh, as you know, it's just it's 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 not a very um, well publicized science as far as what's on YouTube. I mean, obviously, you go to YouTube to try to figure this stuff out. So we we go to YouTube, and yeah, that's the first thing. And there's just not a ton of videos out there to try to understand how to observe, how to measure. And uh, and how to do those things. So you know, through about a year's time of trial and error, and and sending even sending stuff to the Minor Planet Center and having them, you know, come back and say, nope, uh, you're not even close. And then uh, and then to uh, we've we've had some great support from guys like David Rankin, who I reached out to on YouTube and sent some of my images to, and and uh, through that. So through the time, we've been able to uh, understand, figure out. We've had incredible support from our friends at Telescopes.net. Uh, that have supplied us with amazing equipment to uh, help out as well. And through that process, you know, we, we were able to get our observatory code. And basically now what we do is we, you know, on a, on a weekly basis, we, uh, we have in the last, well, in the last few months, we built an observatory right outside of our, our garage out here. And uh, we opened the, open the, um, the door on, or the roof on this thing. And uh, we look at, uh, we, we take observations every night. And now we're collecting data and we're sending it to the Minor Planet Center. Now, um, through this, what's, what's been pretty incredible through this ride is that uh, we, you know, we said, hey, let's create this channel. Let's, uh, let's show how we're doing this stuff. It's a really a father-son adventure and we've had a great time, but through it, we, uh, we were able to get hooked up with uh, Mike Akey and the Worldwide Variable Star Hunter team. And Mike uh, reached out to us and said, hey, we we uh, we have a telescope in Abu Dhabi, a twenty four inch plane wave. Which uh, Tony, you are a part of the team, and uh, right, we're going to be uh, doing a hangout on that. Uh, yeah, in the, for in the sure. Future. So, yeah. and he reached out, and said, "Hey, we we're putting together a, a observation team to do real science for for these big organizations, and uh, so, and we want you to to lead up the asteroid division." And I and I was like, "Whoa, okay, you know how did <laughs> how did this happen?" Yeah. Well, he watched our YouTube videos and and just was like, "You guys know what you're doing. You've." You've gone through the ringer, so here it is. So um, through that, you know, we're, we've been we're we're starting to do some work with Atlas, 
uh, obviously the tests, uh, we're doing exoplanet research with tests. Now we've got, uh, we've, my son and I bagged a supernova for assassin. We're working with assassin. So we were able to get a supernova conference confirmation a few months ago. We got written up in the ATEL, which has just been incredible. And, uh, but through that, we found Sam who, uh, is part of our team here. And, uh, Sam is just, uh, he's just an expert when it comes to, to this, uh, this science, you know, and, and, uh, he's been a real resource for us and, we're just real grateful for him. But this is Sam's really, really great at what he really specializes is in is finding finding lost objects. And uh, uh, he's walked me through times where he'll go through these sky surveys and and he'll look at uh, orbits of uh, some of these objects that were seen years ago and try to reacquire them, which to me is like extremely difficult. But Sam will do it over uh, over these sky surveys. And I'm just I'm so impressed by that. Uh, but yeah, so we're, we don't claim to be experts by any stretch of the field, but, uh, but we are learning and, um, we are fortunately part of an amazing team. Um, I want to show you real quick. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to screen share yeah, go uh, ahead. our, uh, just real quick, our, uh, our, uh, telescope here. So we recently just got a, uh, we're running a 14 edge, um, HD, uh, we are, uh, running hyperstar. We want to shout out to our friend, uh, Dean there at Starzona. Who is uh, just taking care of us greatly on that? And Not me, uh, so we are. <laughs> we are running. We are running. A, we are running a Hyperstar with a ZWO camera and a and a CGE Pro uh, mount. And uh, this is in our observatory, just right out right outside of our door. So we uh, we are remoted into it. So we just control it right here from the garage. And uh, this is this is our setup that we use on a nightly basis uh, when we can. And uh, that's that's pretty much our kind of our story and. And like I said, this channel just keeps growing and growing and growing and uh, uh, meeting gentlemen like you, Tony, to, uh, that are interested in the science that we're doing. And we're just really fired up to, uh, to be part of it. And uh, my son, you know, he's, it, it's, it's really, it's amazing to see my 15 year old son involved. And, yeah, and that's involved my, I love that, that about well, what you're you know? doing. So, I, I'm really, yeah. I really think that's amazing. Uh, so Sam, you start with you you one of the things you're apparently really good at is you take data from older survey older surveys the objects that have been found usually by automation and then you try to reacquire them again is that correct yeah that's correct uh i originally got into this sort of thing back when i was uh let's see here and i was 13 at the time i was insane <laughs> <laughs> uh i was basically trying to be like man I want to contribute to uh, science and helping get like astronomy, space stuff better known, not just to the public, but just like in general. Uh, but since I'm 13, I really can't like get a telescope and start observing on my own. So what can I do? Uh, turns out there's just a ton of already available space data that's been there for years. That's that right. That's the exactly big surveys right. are just tossing out there. It's like, free. Like it's <laughs> yeah, it is free. <laughs> Uh, so I figured they can't possibly have, like, searched all of this dry. So I started looking around and found that they actually haven't remotely searched any of it dry. And nope. there's just tons of stuff all over the place that nobody's even bothered looking at. Yep. Uh, I think some of the more interesting stuff that I've done recently is that there's a bunch of... Uh, I assume you've heard of the Planet Nine hypothesis, Tony. But yes. just for anyone who's I, in not fact, I've had a hangout with Mike Gatti, uh, Mike um, Constantine Badigan and Mike Brown. So we we talked about it before. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. Well, to catch anyone up who is not aware of it, uh, basically, there's it been a lot of objects that are in the really far out of solar system that have really weird orbits that we can't really explain by them having been tossed into that orbit by Neptune or any other known planet. And all of them seem to have orbits that indicate that there's about a five or ten times the mass of Earth object somewhere way out in the outer solar system. Uh, however, we haven't been able to see it yet. Uh, there's a lot of different people, including Mike Brown and Konstantin Betijin, who are working on that. Um, but none of them have managed to, at least they haven't declared that they found it yet. They're probably hiding on a few really good objects right now. Uh, anyway... <laughs> So right now, the main thing for us uh, plebeians without eight meter telescopes to do is uh, what I've been trying to do is find archival images of some of those asteroids that they've been using to imply it and trying to find more images to know their orbit better. 
So if you know the orbit of the things that are tossing that are being tossed around, you can probably find out the orbit of the thing tossing them around better. Uh, there was one that was uh, 2003 SS422, total license plate name, I know, that uh, was discovered in September 2003 and observed until November 2003. And I'm currently working on uh, finding it, getting it a bit more than just two months of observations because trying to plot the orbit of something that takes thousands of years to orbit with only two months of observations is just an exercise in futility. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but Sam loves it. He loves it. I know you live for this, Sam. I know you do. It's awesome. It's awesome <laughs> being able to look at like an image that was taken like 15 years ago and being like, I'm the first person to see this image. Yeah. <laughs> and seeing an asteroid in that image and being like, I'm one of the first people to ever see this thing ever. Well, you can't and, really compare that with anything and else. And you know what's, what's fascinating, Tony, too? Sam will, Sam will come back and say, hey, you know, uh, this, this object popped up recently, but I firmly believe it was an object that we saw, you know, 20 years ago and, or 10 years ago or whatever it was. And, the, and, and, and we lost, we've had it for two weeks and we lost it. But uh, when it came back in, we think it's a new object. But I, but, and he'll, he'll show those orbits and you just go, wow, like, yeah. you're, it looks like you're right, Sam. Like it looks like that—that that was the object that we saw ten years ago and lost, and now we're just calling it something else as it comes in. And uh, it's pretty fascinating to uh, sit with him when he when he walks through this stuff and see those things. And know? that's a skill set that's going to serve you real well, Sam, because I can tell you, having worked on these surveys professionally, there are certain science objectives that everybody's trying to get out of their data once these data are taken. Uh, and then, you know, the Sloan Digital Skies Survey is a good example, right? There were there were lots of science. They were out to, you know, map a lot of galaxies and get the large scale structure of the universe down with a lot with red shifts. Uh, and they did that with their first with their first uh, observing runs. And then they came out with data releases. They're still coming out with data releases. But what ends up happening is they they get their first list of objects out. They publish their papers or whatever it is. Funding is either still there or not still there. If it's not still there, then the number of papers goes down quite a bit. But it relies on people like yourself and also other astronomers who are paid to do this to look at these surveys and go back through them to try and find more stuff. Because you're right, there's no way you're going to get all of this stuff. I mean, I worked on the Dark Energy Survey, and as it came as the data came off the the DCAM. We were still we were able to get billions of galaxies or billions of objects, I should say, some of which were galaxies, some were clusters, some were other things. But uh, there's still the process of winnowing down these objects to make sure, first of all, they are what we think they are. And then with every data release, it gets better and better. It's the same with the other data sets you guys are using with Gaia, right? You guys use Gaia a lot uh, yeah. to get ast astrometric information. So uh, these data releases keep getting better, but it is a it is incumbent on somebody to go back through this data and look at it a little bit closer. And the fact that you're doing it now, Sam, as a, as a uh, college student, uh, <laughs> I'm telling you now, if you want it, I don't know what your go career goals are, but <laughs> if, it, if it is to go into professional astronomy, you're not going to have any trouble finding any work. I can promise you that. That's, well, right now, I skills. can assure you, uh, I would prefer nothing more than for a big survey like the Dark Energy Survey to just take me under its wing and be like, Sam, Find me a billion asteroids, and I'm going to be like, hell yeah. <laughs> well, that was not one of its stated science goals. However, it's something that you can do with when you take lots of images of big areas of the sky. The Dark Energy Survey only looked at 5,000 square degrees of the sky for yeah. 525 nights, and then it stopped. It was done. Um, but there's still you can still get a lot of – I mean, they were – obviously interested in characterizing dark energy, but they were also looking at other uh, cosmological parameters as well. But the side science that can be done is transients and things like this, because when you look at a big area of the sky, you see things moving through, just like this little moon here. Um, yeah, and, you know, I was and actually let, using... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. No, go ahead, oh, please. Oh. I was actually using the dark energy survey, like, last night to find a lost asteroid. Uh, I forget... I think it was one of those asteroids whose orbit always remains inside of Earth. Uh, those ones that we've been getting really good at finding recently. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually using the Dark Energy Survey to try and find some images of it uh, from back in 2016. It was a bit challenging because uh, it was really close to the sun. <laughs> uh, but also because it's been several years ago. Uh, but the Dark Energy Survey still has a ton to offer. And uh, Oh, yeah. 
Well, I guess thanks to both you and also the rest of the team who worked on that for uh, helping that become a thing. Yeah, and it, it's I I, I want to talk a lot more about this uh, in just a second, but I need to give some shout outs here. Yeah, the talk the the chat people are talking about Econ Greg. Okay. I want to have a, a, a hangout with Econ Greg on this channel at some point. But yes, if you ha he is also a Twitch streamer that uh, does uh, has a great. And he is part of our uh, our team for the. He's World also Wide part of the. W that's Absolutely. right. WWSVH uh, or whatever. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> that's one of the longer acronyms. Uh, but he is and he streams on Twitch as well. You got to go check him out because these people are doing. In addition to Asteroid Hunters and what Mike Geeky is doing with uh, the World by Variable Star Hunters and Econ Greg, all of these people are making astronomy available to you in a variety of different capacities. Now, one of the things I want to distinguish are, are the lot. There's there's Twitch streamers out there, and there's also people on YouTube who are doing a lot of back, great backyard astronomy and taking of images and stuff like that. But and I was talking about this with Aki the other day on his on 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 Discord. One of the things I'm most excited about is the kind of things that people like, you know, these guys, uh, Sam and Mike, uh, Mike from Asteroid Hunters, Mike, uh, are doing is the, the science that can be done with equipment that you can just buy and set up. And, you know, it took Mike, it took you, you said about a year, right, before you were finally ready to yes. start streaming and things and, like that. Yeah, well, and, and uh, yeah, I was, I'm glad you're talking about this because that's what I want to talk about. Because okay. I'm seeing in the chat, we had some people go, how did you catch a supernova with that? telescope yeah in your go backyard. ahead talk about that and uh i just you know uh well econ greg who runs a uh also an 11 raza uh has captured uh, a number of supernovas on our for our team uh for assassin and uh i i gotta tell you man that and you and i talked about this tony when you when we were, you were on our stream the other night is mm -hmm. is technology now these cameras <laughs> uh are just allowing you to do so much yeah. right from your backyard uh you don't have to have I mean, we are fortunate. We do, by the way, we do have a telescope in uh, Abu Dhabi that is a 24-inch plane wave uh, that Mike Aki uh, has set up, and uh, uh, we have we get to use that. But but we also have these other scopes, and we we can utilize this stuff with these with these cameras, these sensors, and uh, the optics that we have nowadays. Just really make it uh, feasible to be able to capture these objects and these deep sky objects with just a backyard telescope. Um, you know, I've I've heard of people doing these things with eight inch even below you know um i had somebody one time it uh was telling me about uh uh at, at the store at uh, woodland hills camera telescope there my buddy daniel was telling me he he goes i i can't believe a guy was talking about a supernova with a with a, a etx 90 like what like, yeah and he and he saw the he saw that's the a images. small scope like, that is tiny like yeah. how is that possible it's yeah. like but you know what man i just i mean with this kind of equipment that is available to us as consumers as well we don't have to have these gigantic things and especially the cameras the cameras have made all the difference in the world for us uh as far as the quality and the sense of the, you know how sensitive they are um that you can get for you know for the money it's just it's unbelievable what is available to us now that was not available to us 10 15 years ago yeah. 20 years ago you know so it, it has allowed us and and the, and the fact is we did start with an eight inch uh, edge that's what i started with uh and and i gotta tell you we 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 are 35 miles north of los angeles people that's where that's where we are located that's where we are at well i can tell you 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 already know 35 miles north of los angeles we have bordel five skies i don't have i have <laughs> i mean that's not a good I'm, night you know that's not a good night right <laughs> yeah you know and and we got some transparency i mean it, there's there's times when it's kind of dark out here but but i'm still 35 miles you know so but but the, what allows me to do it is is the hyperstar so I, you know, I put a hyperstar on this on this 14 inch telescope. I'm shooting f 1.9. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I can I shoot 15 to 30 second images. It's like shooting for for you know five to 10 minutes on a normal you know if I was to put the thing on the on the back of it you know so um, you know it's just it, it, if it wasn't for the hyperstar I wouldn't be able to do this science. I can tell you that right now. It would be very difficult uh, to try to do it, but. But technology has allowed us to be able to do it and to just do it right here yep. from home. Yep. And I, that, that excites me no end. I mean, that, that, that is what turns my crank. And especially the kind of thing that Worldwide Variable Star Hunters is doing with the test data. That in, I love the fact that NEOs are being looked at. It, it is. It's cool, but it not, it's not my thing. What I care about are these transit curves that are coming out of tests, being able to confirm the 
the you know these candidates ourselves that's something i want to get involved in myself and i you know since i don't have a 24 inch play plane wave i certainly want to look over the shoulder of people who do and and get what uh get what observations we can from that to me that is the future of amateur astronomy i get it that that that, that, that taking images has is is wonderful the prettier the better but that's a that's a frontier that has been conquered this is new and this yeah. is this is this is going to be in my opinion uh the most exciting frontier for amateur astronomy and so i'm excited about that more than anything else and um so with people like well, what econ greg yeah, is I, doing and what you guys are doing and what mike is doing my cake is doing uh this is like it's an explosion of people i'm just meeting and seeing I'm like wow hey guys let me join i want to be a part of this so I'm all about yeah, it. I it's think so great. great. It's the, this, the, the guys we have on the team are just exceptional. And, uh, and yeah, every day is, is something exciting. I mean, I mean, we can't share too much about the test stuff right now, but, uh, but there are the exciting things happening, uh, with that. And, uh, and we're just, we're incredible. It's just incredibly part of it. I mean, we have, we have, uh, Atlas, a uh, gentleman from Atlas that we're involved with. We have assassin that we're doing supernova stuff for. Right. It's just, it's just, uh, it's incredible. Um, to, to be part of these guys. Uh, you know, I sit back, I look at guys like Sam and I'm, in, I'm in awe. I'm like, wow. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's incredible to see these minds, uh, in action. I, I tell AK all the time, I go, man, I'm, I'm just here for the ride, man. Like I, yeah, my son and too. I, we're so new at this. I don't know. You know, <laughs> all, I'm, I'm the guy that, Hey, you, you tell me where to point the thing and I'm going to point the thing and I'm going to get those images for you. Yeah. You know, uh, and then, and then we send it to the people that, that can really measure the data and do those things. But, uh, but my expertise is collection, you know, and, and, and I, and this kind of started too because about about a year ago I don't know what happened to me in my life but I uh, I started getting pretty heavily into the history of astronomy and uh, I was sharing with you the other night I have a pretty good astronomical library set up here and and I started getting really fascinated with the 16th 17th century guys and guys like William Herschel and Caroline and these other people that that they were doing so much with so little and the, that's what that's what blew me away it's like these guys were like really given so much to science and they just had nothing as far as equipment goes and the majority of their stuff was pretty spot on you know in a lot of ways and you sit back and go wow you know that that really was was meaningful so so when we started my son and I started looking at this I said Brennan you know we need to we need to do something that that kind of contributes you know I mean I love putting the eyepiece on and looking and doing those things but can we collect data and contribute to to humanity and to to those things and and that's how it started was was really through those you know studying those the history of those guys and what they did and and uh you know and it's 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 just an exciting time man to be in astronomy i got to tell you yeah well it's an interesting comparison because back in the days you're talking about with Herschel et al uh these these were back in the days of gentlemen naturalists right these were like Absolutely. Darwin was one. They were already independently wealthy. They could, you know, study science at their leisure and did so. And they were the ones, the primary drivers of our knowledge. Uh, you know, the professional astronomer and professional scientist didn't come really come around until the 20th century. But, uh, you know, so it's an interesting comparison because now we're kind of back to that where, well, we may not all be people of leisure, <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, country gentlemen in the estates who, who could, you know, had massive wealth. But what we don't have in wealth, we make up for in leveraging our technology to get us to do these things. And so we have that now. And, um, you know, I don't know um, what's I guess what's humbling to me is that even though I spent my career doing things like I was a software engineer, my strength is data management and data pipelines and calibration and all of that kind of stuff just from raw data and also controlling and programming cameras. I realize now that I've retired from that, that I can do this as a hobby on my own with equipment that I can just buy. And right. that is astonishing to me. I mean, the Department of Energy had to give a grant to and the National Science Foundation to, get, to give a grant for this 500 megapixel camera for, D, for the Dark Energy Survey. That kind of stuff, while it's important, you need it, you got to be able to see magnitude 22 galaxies with it, things like that on a four meter telescope. You can have a 14-inch scope or a 24-inch plane wave or something like that uh, access accessible to you and do very, very similar sky survey work. So it really is a golden age. And it's interesting because it's very similar to, although they had to invent their telescopes. I think Herschel had to invent <laughs> his telescope uh, yeah, that he ended sure. up using. Uh, but, you know, we do live in a very similar time. That's an interesting comparison. 
Yeah, for sure. And and like you said, I mean the imaging I I get all the time people are like, "Hey, you going when are you going to send some some pictures, some pretty images up?" You know, I get I get that and I go, "Hey, you know what? I I leave that to the guys that are the real experts of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the Dylan O'Donnells of the world like that that spend the time processing, getting it getting it really right, uh getting that data right. Uh that that is an art form in itself and uh uh, I, I totally admire those guys and I uh, love looking at those images. Yep. It's just, uh, we just love the science where I'm all about, you know, the raw, more raw, the better for me. That's, that's what I'm about. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And, uh, it, it, there's a thrill there. I mean, there's an absolute thrill. The first time you take a picture of the Orion Nebula, there's a thrill, but there's nothing like seeing a light curve, uh, that, that you've generated with your stuff of a planet going across the face of a star or confirming a supernova or whatever it is uh, that that is equally that's more exciting to me yeah, yeah. yeah and, you, and you're right i mean i mean just two nights ago we were imaging a couple asteroids and they were i'm, I'm still tr testing this 14 you know this 14 just testing the limits and we were looking at some that were about 18 mag almost 18 magnitude and and i was capturing them and i took measurements and i submit them and the next day there they are in the minor planet center as far as the you know in the <laughs> As, as accepted observations yep. and i gotta tell you man it's like it's like christmas when i see that i go oh my gosh you know <laughs> Congratulations, i mean it's dude. just exciting you know <laughs> like like you know and we've had a number of them that we put in there and we've and we we got it pretty figured out now but but it's like wow we're we're even going deeper because you know we had an 11 before that i was not able to capture you know 18 magnitude and 11 but but with a 14 it's like it's kind of opened up a whole new realm for us so yeah, bet. Uh, bet. it's just exciting nice exciting stuff yeah man i just we just love it so much man Okay, before hey, can we... I mention something real quick? No, we're done with Thanks. you. Sorry, Sam. Bye. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, man. Go for it. Uh, I was gonna say, I'm directing this at you, the stream viewers. You guys don't think I'm talking to you specifically, but I am talking you specifically. <laughs> are not any different from what I am. <laughs> I am an amateur. I have not gotten a PhD. I don't have any kind of professional background in this. I'm exactly the same as you are. So as you if I can do this astronomy stuff, <laughs> then you can do this astronomy stuff. That's true. You have the universe at your fingertips in a way that you have never had it ever before. And there is nothing stopping you right now except for your own inhibition, inhibition to doing it. Wow. Yeah, let, so, let me ask you, Sam. Well said. Let me let me ask you, Sam, do you even own a telescope? No, I don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I brought that up. I bring that up to people all the time. I go, this guy is doing this work. He doesn't even own a telescope, yeah, people. Yeah. He doesn't know one. Well, a lot of people don't know that, you know, you can get access to the best data, the best images ever taken by, you can, your Hubble data is free. You know, so is, uh, so is all the stuff that ESA takes and ESO, all that data, you can just have it. It's yours. Yep, so you know? is DCAM. DCAM. That's, that's right. That data is, if it's paid for by the taxpayer, it is available for years for you to use after an embargo in some cases, but you know, we're talking a year or most, but that data is out there. It's free. It's yours. You want a Hubble image. You want it. You could say the Hubble is your telescope because it is you, you paid it for is. it and the data are there for you to take. And what better image, uh, to have than something taken by that. So that's right. This all of this is accessible to you. So that's really, really well said, Sam. Uh, what are you studying in college, by the way? I'm studying music. I'm kidding. I'm studying astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of astronomers well, are musicians. Yeah, so that's true. okay. That's not... I, I'm actually that's kind of my main thing. I'm I'm actually my main job is I'm an audio uh, audio post production uh, mixer. Oh god! Uh, I, I mix uh, I mix television shows and uh, film trailers and stuff. So which is, I, I do a lot of work for a lot of things that you guys are familiar with. Uh, uh, I do uh, I've done stuff for uh, uh, Marvel and Disney and a lot of the marketing that you've seen on television. I've mixed so so I'm nice. I'm actually a musician. So I, I tell that to people go oh, musicians or could be astronomers too. So it wouldn't have been odd, Sam, for you to say that. <laughs> Okay. Well, I want to go real quick because I forgot to do this at the top of the hangout. What can you show us, Mike, the orbit of this thing? I mean, uh, we uh, we got the simulation from Sam, but you have yeah, another view this, of this uh, orbit. I'm going to show you guys orbit. this. Uh, yeah, I forgot to show um, that. So okay, if you guys haven't looked, there's this uh, um, CSS orbit view uh, that our friend there, David Rankin, wrote. And, uh, and this is on the Catalina Sky Surveys website this uh actual um that's a nice site by the way here. so yeah it's a great great site but basically what you do is you just put your um, um object designation in there and then just hit this find mclore button and it's going to show you where 
where the orbit of these objects are, and then you can move them forward and back. And you can see this object is obviously right now it's because it's so close to us, it's 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 you know cruising along with us. Now Sam Sam kind of showed that simulation of what what would probably is going to happen to it, but um, this. I love this software because you can just move this thing forward and back, and then it kind of gives you the actual distance from the Earth in AU and distance from the Sun uh, oh, as well. Uh, sorry and then to you can kind of move quick. this thing around. Yes, sir. Uh, but the this, sorry, the simulation I had was it going back in time. The thing right now is leaving Earth orbit. Uh, what you got right there is what its orbit is uh, now after leaving Earth orbit. So yeah, my thing was going backwards. Your thing's going forwards. Forwards, right? Right. right. That's a good distinction. Right. All right, and so, so but this this I, we use this all the time though to because we'll put in objects because I'll I want to see what you know and it'll show all kinds of various um, orbit tracks of where things are at. It's a really nice nice okay. little way to see these things. Yeah, that's good. I, I wanted to, yeah I wanted to point out this website because it's a really great uh, place to go to play with some of this stuff and to see for yourselves what these objects are like and whether or not they are uh, you know something you need to worry about because we get a lot of people a lot of people were worried about this thing. God, it exploded on the news, didn't it? I mean, people were just like, "Oh, yeah." Well, uh, uh, you, you, look, we get a lot of a lot of explosions on the news anytime something comes in close. I've had, uh, you, you know, Sam knows. In the last uh, few months, we've had a number of objects that we we've, we've just discovered that were that were like, "Whoa, that that came really close to us," <laughs> and yeah. we didn't and we didn't see it. You know, when the sun's at its back, or something it's hard for us to see some of these objects, and there's so many of them out there that uh, sometimes we don't see them till they're right on top of us and we don't yeah, know we can't so. spot half of everything out there because yeah. it's coming at us from the sun and not from, from the, sun. the opposite yeah. so it's so you know it's like that's why this this data you know observations are so important so when something pops up we can see but uh um but yeah it's it, it definitely exploded we get as like i said we get i get all the time man people are going oh my gosh you know did you see this did you see that yeah you, you know the, the, we gotta we also gotta put put some stuff in perspective, you know, on, uh, on some of this, cause I've had some people uh, be, be, be concerned <laughs> and, and, you know, like, look, we're, we're, we're paying attention to these objects right now. There's nothing that's, uh, uh, that's going to hit us and, and is, is uh, harmful to us at this moment that we need to be concerned about. Uh, I told somebody the other day, I said, look, it's, it's much more relevant that you could get into a car accident driving to your work than uh, get hit by an asteroid today. So don't, you know, please don't lose sleep over these things right now you know um so um but yeah it's like sam said it's it is tricky because some of these come around the back of the sun we don't see them and uh these observations that we take are very important but uh but yeah don't believe ev everything you see in the news headlines because uh sometimes they're looking for the glory of the doom and gloom you know i know we were talking about uh, beetlejuice the other day a couple weeks ago and i was showing a tech times uh, website article on that about how it just it was full of contradictions. It was almost like it was written by some bot that just copied and pasted a bunch of phrases and put it in an article that that made absolutely no sense. Uh, so you definitely want to you know do some thinking for yourself with this stuff, and um, you know that's why websites like this, you know, streams like what Asteroid Hunters is doing and the kind of work that's out there, uh, you guys can make become a part of and uh you know interact with yourself so these are all resources that that we have now that we didn't have just shoot i don't know last year we didn't even have this stuff right so this is this is all new stuff for everybody um the worldwide variable star hunters is just getting started uh and their their work is ramping up so all of this is at the cusp of some really exciting times um yeah for sure okay so go ahead and stop sharing your screen and i'll do a couple okay. let me read a couple of things here from the the stream. Oh, I, I, I want to ask you about Apophis real quick. Uh, so astronomers, professional NEO guys are really excited about uh, uh, April 2029 because this really large asteroid is going to make a very close flyby with Earth. Um, are you guys going to be able to do any observations? Are you able to do any observations now of Apophis or is it out of range of your stuff? Uh, and when it is, do you look at it when it is in range? Where's it? Uh, well, if it is in range, and and so what? What I'll do is I'll generally for myself. Sam, Sam can answer some of this too, but for us here, what we'll do is you know we go into the database every day for the Minor Planet Center and and basically look up stuff that they classify as what needs orbital you know improvement or they need data on. Uh, so depending on where Apophis is at this given time, uh, it may be too dim for us to see. I'm I'm kind of uh, limited to about magnitude 18 on what we are doing plus. Obviously, uh, position in the sky, 
um, is, is a big factor because we've, we've got a few little mountains around us and kind of the position of where we're at. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll basically go on there and, and kind of catalog and figure out what does it call for? What is it not? And, and usually there's a handful of them that, that they need data on. And uh, so we'll go through that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where Apophis is right now. I can answer uh, that. Sam, I was just going to say, Sam <laughs> Sam can tell you in a second here, you know. So why don't you go ahead, Where is it right now, Sam? Uh, where's it at right now? Uh, right now, Apophis is at right ascension uh, RA0337 and declination 13 degrees north. Uh, it actually hasn't been seen in a very long time from 2015 to about a month ago. But uh, last month, it actually got into a really favorable position to be seen. And right now is actually around magnitude 20 or so. And so people are eating it up because not only is it going to be coming really close to us, but uh, we actually haven't still completely ruled out it may be impacting us in the future. It's really unlikely. I want to be, disclaimer, it's very unlikely. Well, certainly not in 2029, not in 30, no, no, 2036, no. but maybe the 2064 one. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the earliest impact chance is 2060. 60, and yeah. uh, the total chance of it hitting us any time in the next 100 years is only one in 100,000. So mm -hmm. there's a 99,999 in 100,000 chance it won't hit us. <laughs> it's not yeah, zero, so though. <laughs> <laughs> so well we're so doing I'm, our best to make it zero exactly so and i'm and i'm looking right now there are uh well i can tell you right now from uh uh there are four thousand five hundred and twenty observations recorded on it uh sam is right it it was it was kind of not seen from about 2015 we picked it up somebody picked it up in 2019 a couple observations on it but really it's from about January till uh, just a few days ago, what's the date? 27th. The last observation recorded here is on uh, February 22nd at uh, 19 magnitude from uh, uh, Observatory Code 511. And uh, yeah, position in the sky where it's at right now. If I was, if you were to say, "Hey, can you look at it?" It's, it's uh, plus 12 is the deck, which is good for me, but it's at an RA of 03, which would put it pretty far in the west. Uh, when the sun goes down, I probably wouldn't. And and it, at 20 magnitude, I wouldn't be able to capture it, but. Uh, but there are definitely some observations that are happening right now on it um, um, from from the minor planets. Well, I just wanted to add so. that the reason it's so exciting, especially the 2029 flyby, is that this will be the closest something this large uh, has gotten this close in, I think, close to a thousand years. And so astronomers want to use that flyby opportunity. I just made a video on this is why I know so much about it. They, uh, they want to use this opportunity to study what these objects are like. It's going to get underneath the orbit of geosynchronous satellites. So it's going to get really close. A billion people will be able to see this thing with their naked eye uh, as it yeah. flies by. So this will be a big deal. And I so I just wanted to mention it because, you know, 2029 is, you know, a long way away. But, you know, it's still part of what you're doing. And it's, it's interesting to a lot of us. Uh, who are who used to be concerned about it, but not so much anymore. Well, just, if it gets close enough and bright enough, we will absolutely be looking at it. Uh, There's no yep. question. So. And I just wanted to point out that Econ Greg says on on the, um, the 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 chat here that he can get down with his Rasa to about 19 or 20 magnitude, 19 to 20. The uh, the challenge that that uh, and Greg's right, that, but the challenge is, is that we're shooting 15 second exposures because we're going after rocks that are flying around. So that's right. Um, well, what right. is your longest start, exposure that you can generally take? I, well, I mean, for me, I can I can you know I'm guiding. I can take a, a three or four minute exposure. You know, so I we definitely can get out get down and in, into that realm. But but when you're starting to look at these things that are flying around, you have to shoot short exposures. So you're you're only limited to that and. Uh, and and you can't take super long exposures. You get you get trailing and those kind of things in the images, and then it becomes a problem because you can't measure measure them correctly. So um, he is right. You absolutely with uh, with us, we could get uh, twenty mag two with our fourteen. Uh, if if I'm doing some deep sky observations, hence the reason why you can get we we capture supernovas. Somebody said, "How do you do with a backyard uh, uh, piece of equipment?" Well, that's how we do it. Is because yes, we take long exposures. You can get down in, in the magnitude for sure. Uh, but with these objects, they're moving. They're moving around. So we, I can't sit on that for five minutes, you know. But you're uh, also shooting at like f two, right? I'm shooting at f two. Yeah. But generally, our my my observations, my exposures range from fifteen to thirty seconds. That's it. When I start getting uh, more than that, and I start stacking those images to see, I can't get the I I, I cannot get the measurements correct, 
the uh, residuals are not good, and uh, they don't be, they don't become good uh, good recorded images for observation for for orbit at all. So okay, um, and that and that's the reason, like the the Catalina Sky Survey that they're they're shooting. You know, when they do follow up, they have they're shooting about f two with theirs. They're getting they can get about twenty mag two with their you know one meter, uh, but they're shooting f two. Uh, as well, but they can get about 19, 19 and a half, 20 magnitude with theirs shooting 30 seconds. So uh, right. but that's generally the exposure time that we're working with is, is those times. Okay. Well, we're running out of time. So I just want to uh, ask, let people know how they can find you, Mike and Sam, so that they can join your community. When uh, Are you streaming tonight? Uh, what is tonight? Thursday? It's possible. I'm not sure yet. Uh, possible. I've got some stuff, other stuff going on work-wise. I might have to deal with but uh, no if not, you gotta no you I will, can't i know i gotta work. i know i can't deal with work uh -uh, right uh, uh -uh. if i don't stream tonight we will definitely stream uh beginning next week okay. uh we got some stuff happening this weekend but uh yeah um but yeah we are uh, we are on twitch uh asteroid underscore hunters um yep maybe uh maybe if a key's listening we can drop maybe drop the uh we'll put the link there in the description below and, i think i also have it in the description of this uh okay. hangout as well uh and uh definitely check out econ greg on twitch as well as um does a key he doesn't stream as much as you do is that he right? doesn't stream, but he well well you know the plane way was down for a few weeks with some uh, uh equipment repair stuff okay. so but we're we're back up online with that, and uh, he's he's going to be on more. So the other thing we'd love for you guys to do is I want to send you a link to uh, our Discord, uh, yeah. you guys, because we we uh, there's a lot we you know we're building that community there, but we actually have an asteroid science uh, tab uh, that Sam leads, and he leads discussions in there. And uh, if you guys want to pick Sam's brain because he's so knowledgeable on these things, definitely, um, we'll put a link in there for the for the excuse me for the Discord. And you guys can uh, talk in there and, and, you know, pick his brain about these things. And we have all kinds of other channels in there to look at. But we're really trying to build that community out so people can ask questions and, and be part of this. You yeah, know? it's fun. I, I, I check it out a lot. So it's definitely I'll be I'm there as well. And uh, so, yeah, good, good advice. All right. Well, thank you very much. So uh, Mike Forslund, he's the runner of the the runner, the organizer, the operator of Asteroid Hunters, uh, a a stream you also have a youtube channel of the same name Ask i do have a youtube channel so, yeah and we're uh we we do some reviews uh for for telescopes.net up there i have been throwing some of my live streams up there lately uh we kind of have a mix mash of uh, equipment and then also just the live stream stuff so i like the one you and i did the other night we that's right i put up there on youtube so people could see what's going on so um but yeah yeah so and, we have both I'm, I'm i'm working on both platforms uh you know we i haven't you know I, I, am I partial? I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I know you're on both platforms now too, Tony. We're yeah. trying to figure that out, you know? Well, I'm bigger uh, on YouTube so. than Twitch. My, my Twitch profile is real small, but I will plug myself on Tuesdays. There's T cubed, which is Tony's Twitch Tuesday, three o'clock Eastern on Tuesdays. We just, I don't know. We just chat. We just mumble at each other. I, I get the, my, my community and I, we love getting together. I like my, my guys, Galaxy and Peter Q and, and the Larry Keys and all those guys show up and we just talk about whatever interests us. So you're welcome to join us on Tuesdays. I'm also going to be live streaming on Twitch as uh, I get more of the uh, equipment issues worked out. But I'm interested in uh, also promoting a lot of what Mike Akey is doing as well. So I might try and do some more Twitch stuff with him on that if possible. And uh, I don't know. So keep your eyes open for all this stuff. I'm going to have to cut it here because we're out of time. But next week, we will be back with the uh, with the uh, EV scope. So if you want to learn more about that with Unistellar, please join me then. Also, uh, I, I need to just also plug real quick. I've got a new podcast. I'm already doing Space Junk Podcast with OPT. But I also have, I just started this. My wife wrote it. It's a, it's a podcast for young kids called Space Cadet Podcast. It's going live today, today and tomorrow. The first 10 episodes have been recorded and produced. I'm uploading them now. Space Cadet Podcast podcast if you've got a young child or even if you just want to listen yourselves the, each episode's only about five to seven minutes long uh and we do i've got episodes on you know our, you know how do we know there's aliens out there how many planets like earth are there how to become an astronaut so please check out that podcast uh wherever you listen for podcasts so that is live today and i'm still uploading the rest of the episodes the first four are up i'm getting the other six up in the next couple hours Okay. I just dropped the Discord link in the chat for you guys, and then I'll uh, I'll uh, we'll make sure Tony has that as well. On, All right, thank uh, you. Yeah, I appreciate it, and yeah. I'll put it in the uh, description of this video. 
Okay. Thank so, you, Tony. You're what welcome. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Appreciate Sam. It, Best of luck Thanks with so what much you're for doing. Having me. Yeah, you're very yeah. welcome. Thanks for joining on such short notice. Okay, I want to Our thank pleasure. you all so much for watching. I clearly I had a video capture card die on me, which is why I am now looking at my at my uh, webcam instead of my other camera. So <laughs> anyway, it died during the stream. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and as always, keep looking up.